Es iesveicinātu visi darbnīcā reālā laika vizualizācijas programmēšana ar Hydra. Šis norisinās cikli ietveros um, Update Hybrid Labs un šo ciklu atbalsta uh, Eiropas komisijas programma radošā Eiropa. Mēs raidam no Liepājas universitātes mākslas pētījuma laboratorijas. Un uh, turpmāk uh, pasākumu turpināsim āngļu valodā. My name is uh, Kristi Dintere. I'm a lecturer here in Liepāja University and uh, your host for today. We welcome you to the workshop Live Coding Visuals with Hydra by Olivia Jack. Um, this workshop is a part of Update Hybrid Labs event series. Uh, Update Hybrid Labs is a free lecture discussion and workshop cycle, uh, which is held uh, to, uh, to empower artists and uh, other interested people with digital skills for creative content creation. It's organized by uh, Liepāja University Art Research Lab and supported by EU Programme Creative Europe. Today we'll start uh, with presentation and Hydra live, uh, live coding demo by Olivia Jack, uh, which will be followed uh, by a discussion. Uh, so feel free to write your comments uh, and questions uh, to Olivia here on chat and as well on YouTube comments section. Um, so this workshop will continue uh, tomorrow, so on Thursday and Friday in late afternoons from 4 to 7 p.m. And uh, yes, so I'm very glad uh, to introduce our guest and workshop le leader, Olivia Jack. Uh, Olivia Jack is a programmer and artist and performer who works with open source software, live coding and as well experimental interfaces. Her research interests include algorithmic representations of uncertainty and chaos, peer-to-peer -peer networking, and live coding. She is the developer of Hydra, which is a browser-based platform for live coding visuals, and it is inspired by analog video synthesis, um, which I'm sure she will tell us uh, more about. Uh, Hydra is an ongoing research project and it's a software platform that uh, many, many people have taken uh, as well on. And uh, yeah, so it turns uh, your browser window into a kind of a node of a modular video synthesizer. And the project explores the possibilities for collaboration and per performance on the web which is very essential in these times. Uh, I welcome you, Olivia, and I invite you to tell us more about your creative practice, your inspirations, as well as introduce us uh, to the possibilities of live coding with Hydra. So I welcome you, Olivia. Thank you, Krista, and thank you all for having me. Um, this is very exciting. I'm going to go ahead and share my screen now. Um, let's see. And Krista already did a great job um, introducing Hydra, um, but here's a screenshot of it. Hydra runs in the browser and uh, you can directly kind of see the whole editor by going to hydra.ojac.xyz. Um, and as Krista mentioned, it's inspired by analog video synthesis. I'm going to talk a little bit more about what Hydra is and the inspirations for it, and also some connections to other projects that I've developed. Um, and then also do a little bit of a coding demo within Hydra. Um, and so I first started, um, I'm going to backtrack a little bit, and I first started making Hydra when I got interested in, um, um, in analog video synthesis, which is uh, what you can see now is an analog 
video synthesizer called the Sandine Image Processor, created by Dan Sandine in 1977. Um, and so this is similar also to analog sound synthesizers. But basically what you have here is you have these sort of boxes uh, of electronic components and each each box either creates a signal or modifies a signal and when the signal which is a change in voltages over time gets to the tv screen it generates a pattern across the screen and it's similar to analog sound synthesis which but instead of having a screen at the end you have a, a speaker and so the speaker responds to the changes in voltages over time which becomes um, vibrations of sound in time and i got really i really i got really interested in just reading about these and reading about analog synthesizers and wanted to try it out but i didn't have you know all this kind of expensive hardware i didn't have tools or know how to make one myself, but I thought, okay, I'll read about it and sort of um, write code to simulate this, um, this analog hardware. Um, and another source of inspiration for Hydra outside of analog synthesis, um, that's kind of a key part to it is the WebRTC API. And this, this is actually just a technical documentation of a browser API. Um, an API is just sort of a browser library that you can uh, use within code that runs in the browser. And so what WebRTC stands for is Web Real-Time Communication. And it's sort of a protocol that lets browser windows send real-time streams of video and audio and data between each other. And so basically, if you have multiple browser windows open, you can be sending a video stream or an audio stream or a data stream between those, those windows. And so, um, and this is sort of a diagram of, of the kind of communication that WebRTC enables. And one thing exciting about this is that you don't necessarily need a server in order to send this type of information. Basically each, each browser window can act as a either receive video or audio, or it can share video or audio. Um, and I'm gonna explain a little more what this is in a sec. So I know it's a bit, a bit technical possibly, but um, I got interested in this idea of, of um, sharing video streams between browsers. And so this is a, just a video of a demo I did before Hydra existed, but here what you can see is actually each window is sharing a video stream with the other windows. So the, these first two windows send a video stream to the third, to the third um, window. And in that window, the two video streams get blended together. Um, and then that gets sent to the last window. Um, and so basically each window is sharing video streams between each other. And to me, I, I was interested in this as a way to experiment with this kind of new web technology, the web, WebRTC, but use ideas about video synthesis and analog video synthesis as a way to think about um, sending video around the internet. Um, and so I was just interested in this, in WebRTC and streaming on the web, and I wasn't really sure exactly why I was interested or I didn't have a specific plan of what to do with it. And so as I was kind of starting to experiment with this, just this, um, oops, let me see if I can play this again. Um, as I started to experiment with this protocol of WebRTC and this idea of sending video streams on the browser, I started actually live coding in the browser console. You can see in this video, I have the browser console of each window open. 
Um, and as part of this experimentation process, I started writing code um, just within the browser console to change what was happening and to start to experiment with this idea of, of sharing videos with WebRTC. Um, and so this is was before I made Hydra, which I will go into a little bit um, in a second, but I wanted to sort of show the inspiration for it and a bit of how I started live coding is that I, I didn't set out to make a live coding tool. It just was the most direct way to experiment with this um, kind of thing that I wanted to experiment, which is browser, uh, WebRTC and sharing video streams in the browser. So I'll go back to Hydra now, and this is my browser window that's open. And the idea of analog synthesis fits into Hydra at several different le levels. Um, there's this idea that you can share video streams between anyone else who's connected to Hydra, but also the syntax and language itself is really um, inspired by analog video synthesis. And I'm gonna give a little bit of an introduction to that and then step back again and show some kind of broader things that I and other people have done with Hydra. But um, when you open the browser window, you see this kind of, this visuals happening in the back and there's this window in the front. Um, and if you close this window then some text appears on the screen and there's still this colorful visual happening in the background. And the text on the screen is generating what you see in the background. Um, and so one thing with Hydra is when you open it, you immediately see a sketch that someone else has made and you can immediately sort of start to change numbers in the sketch then um, if you press option enter or alt enter, then it runs the code. And so here, for example, if I change uh, a number next to color, it has an effect. Or if I change a number here, um, I start to already create different visuals. And when I introduce people to this, I really like to encourage people to actually just sort of play around and try changing numbers um, similar to if you had a bunch of knobs in front of you and just um, one way to approach kind of learning to code something like this isn't necessarily to learn every everything by heart or to study it all but it's just to try something and see what happens and so often when i first introduce people to hydra i like to say just just play around and see what happens but um, I'm gonna go ahead and clear what's on the screen right now. And I will explain a little bit of how aspects of it work and, and what I mean when I say modular video synthesis. So um, one of the base sort of units of the synthesizer is something called an oscillator. And so if you're familiar with some electronic sound synthesis, you might've used an oscillator. Um, and so in Hydra, in order to create an oscillator, you type OSC dot out. Um, and so if I actually, if I just type OSC um, and I run the code by pressing Alt Enter, um, nothing actually happens. Um, and that's because it's like I've sort of created a signal, but I haven't connected it to the screen yet. And so if I uh, type dot out, that's like connecting the signal that I've created to the screen. And so if I run the code again, I get this oscillating or repeating pattern in the background. Um, I'm just gonna go back really quickly to this image um, of the modular synthesizer. Um, so when, when I type OSC with the parentheses after it here, 
you can think of it as sort of one of these boxes that's generating a signal. And if I change the numbers that are in in parentheses, it's it's similar to turning a knob of a synthesizer. And so I can change the numbers here. Um, and the oscillator has three parameters. One that's frequency, one is how fast it's moving, and the last, which is how separated the colors are. Um, and so here I've created an oscillator and I've connected it to the output by doing this dot out. And then what I can do is I can start to transform that signal. So um, I could do something like add a rotate to it. Um, I could add a kaleidoscope. Um, I could repeat it. And so each of these words that come off after oscillator um, are functions. And so the function transforms the signal that comes before it. And you could think of the function as very similar to in this modular synthesizer, each module. Um, and one of the things that Dan Sandine, the creator of this synthesizer in the 70s talked a lot about was designing the modules in a way that you can combine them in as many ways as possible. And so that's something that I'm interested in in Hydra as well, is that um, each function you can change the order and then it can have a different effect um, on what's happening. There's also um, a pixelate function, let's see. Um, and I think, um, one thing that m creating this sort of language and creating Hydra made me think um, a lot about is how um, in almost any software that we use, there's sort of ideas embedded about the world in it. Like, um, for example, using PowerPoint, there's this idea of a slide and then you show one image and then you show the other and it's sort of derived from when there used to be slide projectors that were physical um, physical things with slide projectors or um, typing into a Word document. There's this idea of when I type on the keyboard, the text, um, it starts at what, one place and it fills out this sort of document on a screen. Um, and we've created this analogy to help us understand when we're interacting with the computer, okay, the text is going to show up in sort of a line and there's going to be a paragraph and um, it has all these kinds of ideas that fit with when typewriters used to exist. Um, and same with kind of graphics programs like Photoshop or um, Illustrator, for example, Photoshop uses lots of ideas that come from photo editing. Um, and so Hydra uses a lot of ideas that come from, from, um, from analog video synthesizers and this idea of routing a signal through different functions and transforming that signal. And um, another thing that you can do in Hydra is here, we're starting with an oscillator, but um, I could, for example, use um, my camera instead. And so uh, here I'm, I turned on the camera, but I haven't actually connected it into my patch. And so if I wanna actually use the camera, I can type SRC. So now, um, now I'm using my camera inside Hydra, and I could, for example, um, change the color of the camera. And so, in this case, instead of starting with the oscillator, I'm starting with the camera, 
but I could still kind of apply the same transformations to it like this um, or repeat it and all of these things. Um, and so in Hydra, in addition to the camera source and in addition to the kind of visual sources that are inside the environment, like an oscillator, um, you can also use any, any window as a source. So any other kind of visual thing that you have happening on your screen can be a source. Um, and you could also use um, uh, a video or an image, the webcam or anyone else, the a live stream of anyone else who's connected to Hydra, whatever they're doing can become an input to uh, your what you're doing. And so um, another thing here, right now we're kind of seeing everything on this one screen, but another thing you could do is actually show multiple, have multiple outputs at one, and, and show one thing on one output and another thing at another output, and then also combine those things together. So something I could also, for example, do here is now create an oscillator. And obviously the next few days in the workshop, I'll go more into this, but I'm just sort of giving a little bit of a demo because I could have one thing going on in one screen, another thing going on in the other screen, then I could use, um, combine those two things. So now um, I'm taking the thing in the top left and I will combine it with the thing in the bottom left and send it out to the screen on the top right. And so, um, Part of um, one of my goals creating Hydro was to make a, a relatively straightforward way in code to combine lots of different sources and outputs together. Um, so here's an example. I think once I started making this and put it put it online. Um, again, Hydra, it started just as so, sort of my own in explorations into this WebRTC API and uh, what you could do with, with browser streaming on the web. And then um, I found it really interesting to play with. And I started sort of doing daily sketches just with Hydra. Um, not even intentionally, I just found myself interested in seeing what kinds of things I could do with it. And so here's an example using using the camera. Um, here's another example of something I tried with Hydra, which was using, um, it's a live stream of Times Square and a live stream of a fish tank. And then in Hydra, I blend the two together. And a lot of my work is, is in the browser. And I think I'm interested in the browser for a lot of different reasons. But one of the obvious reasons is that um, it's very accessible and anyone, you know, it can work on a phone, it could work on a computer. And so instead of making a tool that you have to install and buy and do all of these things with. Um, I really like the immediacy and the liveness of the browser of that you're immediately can ha have all these things interconnected with each other and an experiment with them. And um, another thing that I'm interested in with browser based working with the browser is also um, kind of challenging this idea of the internet as a place or a website as a place that you go to. And also thinking of just um, thinking of a website as a flow of information or a flow of things coming through it. And it might be different each time you go there. Or, um, it might not be a place. 
Um, and so um, I started to make Hydra, I put it online, people started to use it. And I realized that I learned a lot from seeing what other people were doing with it that was really different than the things I had imagined doing with it. And so one thing that I did is I created this Twitter bot, which is basically um, when you're in the editor, you can share a sketch. Um, and um, what that does is it automatically, oops, let me go to Hydra. Um, what that does is it um, automatically shares the sketch that you did on this Twitter bot. And so here you can see kinds of all the different things that other people have been doing um, with Hydra. And one thing that you could do is if you click on this link, it automatically opens the editor with the sketch and the code that someone else generated. And so you can immediately um, change, change the code of what someone else did. Um, and then what happens is if you up, update, upload the sketch again, um, when it shows up in the Twitter gallery, it shows your sketch, but then it also shows whose sketch, what you did was based on. And this is sort of, this is interesting to me again, because I felt like, I feel like seeing what other people do with it, I really learn a lot. And it's one of the things that I think is amazing about open source software and um, having a community of people using something is that then um, everyone can share and sort of learn from each other. And another thing I was interested in creating this bot is, is this idea that everyone is sort of inspired by other people and that um, being able to trace like, oh, this idea came from this other idea as sort of a collective sketchbook of, of ideas that people have, have made with this tool was really interesting to me. And I think um, with code, sometimes there's this idea that some people kind of just like are lone geniuses who know how to do everything and kind of woke up one day and wrote all this amazing code. And especially sometimes with generative art, I think everything that people do is built on things that people, other people have done. Um, pretty much any kind of software you can ever write is built on software that other people have written, unless you're building a computer completely from scratch. And so this was one way um, that was interesting to me of exploring this genealogy that everything everything you do is sort of based on things that other people have done. And, and it's something that I've realized, again, as I just gone from just some of my own experiments in the browser to then something that other people use to then kind of a community of people who use it, is that all of these technical decisions about how I set up the software and how I create the editor um, become sort of decisions about a, a community of people who use this and engage with with each other as they use this. Um, and also, as I started to, I think I, I started making Hydra three years ago now, or three and a half, almost four years ago, um, and putting sketches online. And then um, I started being invited to perform in live coding events. And I know Shelly was here last week, who's a big force in the live coding world. Um, and live coding is sort of the practice of writing code in front of people to generate music and or visuals as a performance. And I really, I've been a programmer for a long time and I'm relatively new to live coding. And I came at it because I had these ideas that I wanted to explore and the most direct way to explore them was instead of writing a whole bunch of code that then 
is com is compiled and then you see the result later. Um, live coding allowed me to sort of try something out and immediately see the result of it. And so that's how Hydra came to be this live coding platform. And then that's also how I started to perform in different live coding events. And one, one kind of thing that happens often in, in live coding events is that people project their screen and they project the code of what they're doing in real time. And so if you're in the audience, you can kind of hear the music and you can, or see the visuals and you can see the code that's creating those visuals. And to me, that's interesting. Um, kind of in thinking of a computer or a laptop as a as an instrument, um, when you project the code, you can sort of see what the person is doing in in real time. So Sim similar to how, you know, if someone's playing the guitar, you can sort of see what they're doing. Um, and I don't think all computer music has to be sharing the screen or something, but it's one way that um, I think uh, within the live coding community, it's common to um, share what you're doing. And I think that's also part of the community aspect of it, of um, it's not so much about, oh, I'm doing this mysterious magic on, on my computer that's top secret that you can never know about. And you just have to kind of imagine um, and like here I'm sharing what I'm doing and maybe that will inspire you or maybe it's sort of opens the dialogue with what's happening during a performance. Um, and personally, I like to use feedback a lot in what I do and feedback is where the output of something becomes the input. Actually, I will show this, I'll show really quick here. Um, a little bit of feedback in Hydra. Um, so uh, one thing I could do is I will use my webcam again. And so, oh, wrong webcam, let's use this one. Um, and let me see. So here I have a webcam and when I turn the webcam back at the um, screen, you start to see this sort of infinite mirror thing happen. Um, and basically what's happening is that the webcam is seeing what's on the screen and what's in the webcam becomes the output of what's on the screen. And then what's on the screen becomes the input again to the webcam. And so when I'm doing this with Hydra, if I add some different transformations, in this case, like inverting it, um, then can immediately start to create these different sorts of effects. Um, and it turns out that, um, just this idea of video feedback is a way of modeling really complex mathematical systems such as fluid dynamics and chaos theory, um, just because of sort of the instability of, of this system where the output becomes the input, becomes the output, um, makes it possible to create sort of really unpredictable, unpredictable things visually. Um, and so I'll put the camera back here, but that one, that's sort of one way of using feedback in Hydra, but another way is just actually directly within the code, um, setting the output to the input. And so in this case, um, I'm starting with the camera and I'm sending it out to this output called O0. But what I could do is actually blend that output back into the source, similar to what I was doing by turning the camera around. Um, and so if I just do this, 
um, you don't see so much of a difference. But there's a second parameter to blend, which is how much to blend. What I'm doing is I'm blending the source, which is the camera, which is with the output, which is the screen called O0. So if I blend this all the way to one, then um, it ends up being a still image because the output's becoming the input, which is becoming the output again. And so nothing's changing. But if I um, put it a little less, I get this sort of ghost trail effect. Um, and then um, one thing I can do is, um, and I'll go more into this in the workshops um, the next day, but there's this function called modulate in Hydra, which is sort of um, a way of warping things. And what it does is it uses the colors of one image to um, sort of warp the other image. And so what I can do here is um, use the camera to, to warp the image that's on the screen. And um, you end up getting this sort of um, liquid, sort of fluid thing happening in the background. And uh, one thing I could do is, for example, increase the contrast a little bit, and then we get even more um, of this kind of uh, fluid effects. And so just using this kind of really simple concept, which is the output of something becomes the input and it changes a little bit each time. Um, it's possible to model things like fluid dynamics or things that often seem um, mathematically really complicated, but maybe there's a way to intuitively sort of understand them and explore them without necessarily knowing the mathematical equations that run them. Um, so back to kind of live coding is, I, I enjoy experimenting with some of these ideas live and especially using the editor itself and feedback with the, the code editor as, itself as kind of part of a, an improvised performance. And so this is, um, this was a part of a performance that I did in New Jersey um, right before the pandemic started. Yeah, and again, I like to start out kind of just showing this direct relationship between the code and and what's happening behind it. Um, but this is, I'm gonna show one more performance that I did 
um, I guess a year and a half ago, and this is actually in a planetarium in Bogota. And um, what you'll see is my browser window, but in a huge planetarium. And this is kind of really different than the last one that I showed. But to me, it was really exciting because I think sometimes it's easy to dismiss things in the browser as, oh, they're just sort of toys. Or if you really want to do video and audio, you need to download the software. Um, and so seeing this huge, um, being able to see what I was doing in this 4K by 4K screen, kind of immersive in the planetarium was really exciting. So let's And that's my mouse cursor up there <laughs> in the sky. Um, and so another thing um, with Hydra is that it runs in the browser and also what's nice is that um, it's, uh, you could, I exported it as a library so you can use it also as part of other web pages. And so here's an example of that. And that's been interesting with, with, for me to experiment especially since the pandemic started, I think is creating different spaces um, for visuals or for performances in, in the web without necessarily using a YouTube video stream or something. Um, and it's been exciting to see what people have been doing with Hydra um, in embedded in websites. Um, and this is a collaborative editor that I made um, that sometimes isn't working, but basically there's three channels of video and it's kind of a different structure to the editor, but when you log in, um, you don't have to have any special user or anything. You can just edit what's on the screen. Um, and, and to me, it was interesting because it, it can be anonymous. I mean, you can also give yourself a name just to have this public visual space that people can do whatever they want to and i noticed people started what i like about this video is in the code it's probably hard to see but people say people start writing messages to each other in the comments um but it's sort of the only way is is through writing code that you could kind of talk to someone else and um another thing that we've been doing more of lately is kind of having a meetup for Hydra. And, and uh, here's an example of the second meetup that we had. Um, and one of the things is we wanted a way for people to be able to share their work without having to use a certain proprietary platform or saying, oh, you have to join Facebook or something in order to share. Um, and so, Basically, what we did was just create a uh, anyone could add whatever they wanted to a collaborative spreadsheet, and then um, whoever signed up, it basically showed them on this list of the the meetup website. And then, um, if you click on someone, it shows kind of whatever it was that they wanted to share for the for the meetup because. Um, when we first decided to have the meetup, about 80 people showed up and 
it was too too many to have everyone you know do a presentation of whatever they wanted to um so one thing with some other people involved in the hydro community we've been exploring how to create these spaces for sharing things um and and um yeah create these spaces for sharing things without uh too much extra work of like creating a whole platform or something and so um the meetup website is a place where you can see some of the things that um, some other people have done with Hydra because I, I think um, now it's so much more than I can even keep track of kind of each day there's someone did something different with it and so um, what I've liked about this is that it's possible to see a little bit of, of what other people are doing. Um, yeah, another thing that I'm really interested in is also sound um, and um, I often collaborate with musical artists and I don't, in Hydra you can make things react to music, but I tend to um, more like to, as a performer, react to the music and sort of interpret what I'm hearing into something visual. But another thing I've been really interested in is sort of using the visuals to control sound. So here's an example of something I did where I'm just using the pixel colors in Hydra. And in this case, it's just triggering samples when the pixel colors change. Um, but I think I'm a really visual person. And so as I've been learning about sound, um, to me, I'm interested in this visual way of exploring it. So I'll show this really quick. Um, so it's a little hard to see what's going on there, but the, basically just by live coding the visual and also live coding these pixel samples, then I could create different kinds of visual score for the sound that you could hear. Um, and this is somewhat related to an, a project I did a long time ago called Pixel Synth um, that basically lets you turn images into, into sound um, and you can either draw or upload an image. I'll show it here, let's see. Um, it gets a bit screechy, but basically the, um, um, what it's doing is converting the different pixels into different frequencies. Um, you can draw or upload an image. Um, but this is something I did sort of a long time ago. And at the moment, I've been interested also in um, um, <laughs> In, in combining this exploration with uh, visual things that I'm doing with Hydra. And the last thing that I wanted to show is also um, kind of another direction that I've been experimenting with based out of Hydra. And um, let's see. Ah. And so what this is, is a hybrid editor that lets you either write code to do something or drag the things around on the screen. And I think as I code a lot, I realize there's some things that I like to do with code 
that give me sort of a high level control of things. But then there's other things that I really like to do um, with gestures, with either dragging um, or with even, I, I like to use MIDI controllers a lot. So like with turning knobs. Um, and so this is sort of a hybrid editor that I've been working on, but um, may never finish or maybe we'll finish sometime, <laughs> but um, that lets you kind of write code or change text and have um, both things affect what's on the screen. And that's all that I have to talk about today. So thank you. And um, I guess we'll turn it over to questions now. Uh, yes, we have uh, already some questions. Um, so first of all, uh, can you export visuals as a movie fast directly from Hydra? Or how does uh, this work? Or is it strictly live and on the web? Um, so there is a way to export movie files, but because of the web API, there's a lot of compression, so it doesn't look so good. So the easiest way is just actually to record your screen. And uh, yeah, so one more question. Uh, in your experience, how do you, how do people usually react to live coding audio audiovisual performances. Um, if there's music, do you ever dance? And yeah, how does that work? That's a good question. I think, um, you know, sometimes live coding performances are called algo raves and, and that sort of implies, oh, it's a rave, there's people dancing. Um, and in my experience, it really depends on the type of music, whether and kind of your goals with it. You know, some people, um, their goal really is to p play music that makes people dance and other people have kind of a more experimental approach and are not as interested in that. Um, um, also, that's one thing about live coding is that you can do any genre of music and for example, um, I lived for a long time in Bogota, Colombia, and there some people play cumbia music, but sort of a more traditional rhythm of music for dancing, but they use live coding um, to do it. And so I think it, it depends on your, on the kind of environment and music that you want to create. Um, yeah. Yeah. Uh... You said that you are actually relative, uh, relatively new to live coding. Uh, what was your uh, previous background and how did you come to visual arts and, and the field of live coding? Um, I've been a programmer for a long time. I've been a programmer for about 12 years and um, I've always worked in kind of creative fields. I worked for a while in a science museum making interactive exhibits about science. And then I also have worked a lot doing live visuals for dance performances using code to create interactive visuals. Um, and I've also, I think I've taught, uh, I've taught coding a lot and I even um, taught coding in the art department of a university for a while. Um, but I don't have, I haven't studied um, art myself. Um, but I guess all of these different things sort of fed into creating a live coding visual um, environment. Mm -hmm. Okay. Uh, what kind of, uh, of uh, software did you use before and how did you come to this idea that you should uh, actually code your own software? Um, I used, I think when I worked at the museum, I used a lot of Flash and then JavaScript and then um, um, for dance performances, I used a lot of C++ and open frameworks. Um, 
and it's interesting because it feels like um i think working with for example generative generative frameworks like processing or open frameworks you can often feel like oh i'm just sketching something or i'm just making something for myself and that that's something that was interesting for me for me is that i never decided oh i'm going to make something for other people so much it i just was making things for myself and i put them online and then it turned into things that other people used and so um i think there's not as big of a divide as it might seem between just doing things for yourself and then making things for other people <laughs> that's something that's kind of beautiful about the browser is that it's it's really immediate to share things yeah uh, what do you think is uh is community actually important to you and uh, do you feel that there's a certain community around live coding and uh, yeah, do you think that uh, uh, working with Hydra, does it uh, blend as well into other uh, communities? Like, yeah. Yeah, um, community is really important to me. And I think one thing I mentioned before is how what started out as sort of a technical thing became a community of people as more people started using it and engaging with it and the direction that Hydra goes really depends on kind of people's interests and the direction that they take it in. Um, in terms of the live coding, coding community in general, one thing that I really like is it's sort of pockets of people interested in, in different parts of the world. And for example, there's a really strong community in Latin America, but there's also communities in Japan and Indonesia and the UK. And um, I think it's it, it's exciting to me to see just pockets of people who are really interested in this in different places. Yeah. Uh, what do you think on on uh, how much does uh, the creative outcomes are dominated by the tools used? Do you feel that there's uh, some, some uh, certain visual aesthetic aesthetics that are unique to Hydra or how does uh, these aesthetics uh, relate to to maybe something that it it has inherited from uh, for instance uh, this uh, video synthesis that's a really interesting question I definitely um, think some a certain aesthetics of Hydra has evolved in a sense where I can if I sometimes I'll see an image and I'll often be pretty sure it was made with Hydra and not using something else just because of um, this kind of often now this textural noisy glitchy um, thing is something that's relatively easy to do in Hydra compared to other things. But one thing I love is that also there's people who use it from really different backgrounds. For example, um, um, especially I'm gonna sneeze. <laughs> Oops, no, I was gonna sneeze, but that didn't happen. Um, but there's like a whole community of people in performing arts who use it or graphic design. And, and so I found it's been relevant to people in really different kinds of fields. Um, or there's people who use a lot of hardware modular audio synthesizers who really like it because of that. And so each of those kind of niche, niches has different aesthetics as well. Uh, talk, talking about visual aesthetics, uh, what are your inspirations in art and uh, where did you draw them from? Um, one thing I used to paint a lot and one thing I'm really inspired by is, is painting and just the idea of sort of layering things onto a canvas and it's something that I like with code as well is to kind of layer things on top of each other. And um, a lot of more computer code aesthetics end up having these like very clean, clean lines and geometric shapes. And I tend to like just much more messy, kind of messy, 
goopy aesthetics. <laughs> um, and, and yeah, really, I, I relate to painting a lot. Okay, that's interesting. Uh, yeah, there's a question from audience. Uh, is Hydro completely free to use and even for commercial projects? Yeah, it is. Um, it has a GPL2 license, which is the open source license um, that if you modify it, your modifications have to be open source as well. Um, but if you use it, you can use it in commercial projects. Um, right now, there's a place for people to donate, but I'm working on a more established way to donate so that people can support the project as well. Okay, uh, when talking about uh, performance, there's an interesting question from the audience. Have you ever tried inserting the audience into the performance? And uh, yeah, if yes, then how, how did you do it? I actually just tried this um, this past weekend. I did a performance online for this festival. Um, based out of Belgium called Oscillation Festival. And I, instead of kind of doing a live stream, um, I made a website where everyone who was attending went to the website and could see me writing code live. And what I did is that everyone who was there could appeared as a mouse cursor, but could also see each other's mouse cursors. And so, and then I used that and the traces of the cursors as a part of the visuals. And so that was one way that I kind of included the audience. Um, and I think there were a few technical difficulties. And so I think for some people it worked really well and for other people um, it didn't work so well. <laughs> and, but I also, um, because I couldn't see the people in real life, I don't know how well it worked completely, but I got some good feedback that some people um, liked it. Yeah, uh, as well, I wanted to ask you uh, how, how, how and if uh, can you uh, kind of uh, implement some, uh, some musical properties like rhythm, pitch, or like, I don't know, te timbral textures into this live visuals? Is, is there a possibility to make uh, audio reactive systems with Hydra? Yeah, so um, there's a few ways. Um, within Hydra, there's a built-in kind of microphone audio input. So, and anything that's a number in Hydra can also be a variable, so you can use um, parameters of the audio to change, for example, the color or the frequency of the oscillator. Um, right now, the only built-in feature is getting the FFT of the audio. And so having parts of the visuals react to certain frequencies of sound. Um, to do something like pitch, um, you could either write JavaScript code to do it or you could send share OSC messages with Hydra and have it respond in certain ways to OSC or MIDI messages. Okay, okay. And yes. we can try that in the, um, tomorrow or the next day. Okay, that sounds, uh, sounds nice. Well, yeah, I somehow have generally a feeling about uh, technologies today that, uh, everything is uh, more or less about user interfaces like in software and all the kind of physical processes are like some so complex that are hidden behind these layers and layers of user interface. Um, so I, I somehow feel that at least for younger people who haven't like touched a, I don't know, a tape recorder, which is like a physical thing. <laughs> they uh, tend to have like less and less uh, kind of knowledge about how stuff works. And what do you think is Hydra somehow uh, a window to kind of understand the, how visuals are made in, in computer or, or is it more like an interface? Uh, yeah. To create. I hope it is a window in some way. And one thing interesting with Hydra is that it's all 
or mostly all code that runs directly on the graphics card. Um, and so it all is basically just deciding what each pixel on the computer, what color each pixel on the computer should be. Um, and a lot of ways of making graphics are much more abstracted than that. For example, you say like draw a circle at this coordinate or something, and then the computer is interpreting if you said draw a circle over here, then that means that you want this pixel to be this color and this pixel to be this color. Um, whereas Hydra is a little bit more direct in that it's really just deciding what color each pixel should be. Um, and I do agree that so much of technology and specifically uh, web design is so focused on obfuscating what's really happening of like making the user experience so smooth. And so it doesn't matter what device you're on, it still works and it works independently of all these things. And um, I think it's interesting to me to make something that doesn't necessarily work as well if you define working as working on every device regardless of any, um, of any kind of way you're using it, but but it lets you kind of connect more to the device and the browser and all these things that are happening. Yeah, <clears throat> I, I somehow feel as well that uh, we kind of tend to humanize machines. And I, uh, yeah, I, by researching uh, before our, our uh, talk, uh, I heard you say in another interview that uh, computer does not have a concept of a web page <laughs> it's like we imagine <laughs> that it's a, like a thinking machine but but there are like these low, lower level processes behind how has this kind of uh, thing inspired you and uh, uh, what do you think about uh, media archaeology is it uh, uh, yeah how important is uh, is is it for for creating hydra um, I think it's very important. I mean, I don't have a formal kind of research practice, but I'm very inspired um, by especially, for example, this synthesizer that Dan Sandine made in the 70s. That was much more inspiring to me than, for example, generative art on the internet today. Um, and then another big inspiration for me is um, Kate Galloway and Shay Rabinowitz who experimented a lot with satellite technology in the early 80s and um, virtual space and live video streams. And to me, some of the stuff that they were doing was is much more interesting to me for whatever reason than a lot of computer stuff that's happening now. Oh, one more, one more that's really inspiring to me is um, a lot of early electronic music in Russia in the 30s was made by drawing out scores. And so Pixel Synth, um, which I showed, is very much inspired by the synthesizer called the ANS synthesizer that was made in the 1930s in Russia, where you draw out the sounds that you want to see. Um, and so I am really interested in kind of really understanding how how things work like how computers work and i feel like that is a big also part of my creative process is understanding how how these things work and kind of the lower level i get the more possibilities are opened up with that uh, what do you think what are uh, the strengths of working with written code to make visuals and uh, when performing, how much control over the things uh, everyone sees do you have? And yeah, uh, don't you sometimes miss some physical controls? I, I mean, um, actually, I tend to use physical controls and code at the same time, and so I have a MIDI controller. And but what I can do is I can live code what the knobs of the MIDI controller correspond to. Um, and so each knob is sort of a variable and I can use that in the code. And I do find what I really like about code is that you can kind of um, 
have really high level control of what's happening. And some, sometimes when I am performing using Hydra, I'll have a lot of code all set up ahead of time and then I can sort of switch between it. Um, but if I change my mind in the middle, I could do something sort of completely different, which is sometimes almost too much freedom um, because with the code you could get rid of everything and if you want to. Um, but yeah, I really, I find some things I really um, like to do with gestures, either using a MIDI controller or using, I like to use the webcam a lot, but not as an image, but more almost as a controller. So the amount of light hitting the webcam controls how much movement you see on the screen. Um, yeah, so I like having these two things together, the code and the physical interfaces. Uh, yes, we have a nice question. Um, can you tell us where, where the name Hydra came from? I, I'm not sure. I needed a name. I, I gave a workshop with this idea I had about streaming and then people were really excited about it and um, were like, oh, where can I use this? And so I had to put it online and I just somehow ended up with the name Hydra. But I think um, I find meaning to it. And um, part of it is kind of... Um, the hydra, hydra is this mythical creature that like when you cut off its head it grows two heads where it's i think it's in greek mythology or that's one meaning of a hydra um and it's sort of this ever growing thing with no beginning point and no end point and um that is one inspiration for it <laughs> okay uh so you said that you are very much inspired by uncertainty and chaos like these concepts and uh, uh, how do you feel they can be approached with Hydra and yeah how much uncertain outcomes do you get from from this uh, generative programming of visuals? Um, I think especially using feedback and using kind of messy or noisy input sources such as a webcam or an audio signal um, Let's lets me have this sort of balance between knowing what's going to happen and not quite knowing what's going to happen. Um, and so that's something that's really interesting to me is that I've written all the code in Hydra, so I know what all the code does. But when I set up these kinds of feedback situations, there's so many things coming in and out that I don't always know exactly what's going to happen. And that creatively is an exciting place for me because if sometimes with making art with code you have to kind of decide everything ahead of time and say I'm going to make this function that does this I'm going to make this function do that but to me one of the kind of create exciting creative things that happen is when something unexpected happens and um I view the computer as sort of a collaborator in this way of like I propose something something slightly different happens, then I react to that and do something slightly different. And that also relates back to live coding is that when you have the system that you can live in real time change and react to, then you can create this sort of organic creative process. Okay, sounds, uh, sounds nice and interesting. Um, yeah, as now culture has migrated mostly online uh, how do you feel, has this anyhow changed how you approach your work or, yeah, because like, it seems like super cool and interesting that, uh, for instance, Hydra and, and other live coding software, it's actually meant for, for connecting people online and, uh, yeah, how, how do you feel, have, have anything changed uh, lately for you? Yeah, it definitely has changed. I've been much less motivated to do live performances, um, which might seem counterintuitive since Hydra can run online and everything. But I think for me, a lot of aspects that I enjoy of it are is sort of the presence in physical space and um, kind of 
creating an experience with other people who were there. And I've had trouble finding that online. But on the other hand, um, it's been really exciting to me to have community online events. And I feel like um, it's been easier for the community that's very geographically distributed to come together because everything's happening online anyways. Um, and I have started to be more excited in some creating these alternative online spaces like um, using the mouse cursor or um, just trying to still create the idea of a sort of shared experience and presence with people online um, that can be in ways maybe different than a comment thread or something. <laughs> yeah, about this, uh, for instance, this uh, mouse uh, cursor connecting thing. Uh, what was the feedback that you got from, from people? Were they excited to see that they are actually participating uh, in this, uh, in, in what they are perceiving? Um, I got someone, someone asked, oh, I hope my cursor didn't bother you. Or someone said, oh, I was drawing on your face because I also had my face in it. Um, but I think I would like to refine it a bit more because um, everyone saw a kind of different thing. And so it was harder to, I think it was hard to understand what was going on. It might've just been too, too much <laughs> but I th but people had fun I think and some people were like doing a dance with their cursor yeah okay ah from your uh, from your uh, previous examples you showed us uh, an, a visual example where where the sounds were triggered from from those uh, those squares and uh, I wanted to ask did Hydra make the audio or it was like sending it as a signal to other other uh, software? Um, I just, I think in that example, I was just using web audio to trigger samples, but I've done it. I've actually experimented with a lot of different things. Um, um, I, some directly in the browser, like using, making an additive synthesizer where different positions correspond to different frequencies of oscillators, but then um, also sending OSC to other, to other programs. But I think that one was just using web audio. Okay. Ah, here's a question from uh, viewers. Is Hydra compatible with other motion, motion sensing devices, for example, Kinect or other? Hydra isn't a motion sensing device. And that example was just using changes in pixel color to um, affect what's happening. You can use, if you have a way of routing the Kinect image to the webcam, then you could use it as a feed via the webcam, or you could um, use a screen capture to use its input um, into, into Hydra. Yeah, okay. Uh, what are the current limits uh, uh, in your experience of Hydra? Like, where's the limit? Um, I think the browser has some limitations, um, but less and less as <laughs> browsers keep getting more and more advanced. Um, yeah, it's, it's yeah. actually very specific. It's actually mostly um, somewhat limited in that you're only, you can only um, kind of make these textures or combine visual textures with other things. But it's hard to, for example, make 3D objects or something like that. So it's, uh, yeah, mostly for 2D kind of graphics. Yeah, it yeah. is because it's a JavaScript library and it's compatible with other things. Um, you can, there's a few different um, ways of either using Hydra as a texture for 3D objects or using a texture with 3D objects as an input to Hydra. 
Um, and that's something that was interesting to me is making it this module and library that can be used with other things. Okay. So in that sense, it's unlimited. <laughs> 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 and the language itself is actually just JavaScript. And so anything that you could do in JavaScript, you could do in the Hydra editor if you wanted to. You might have to write lots of code to do it. Mm -hmm. Okay. Yeah, as, uh, as you were showing us uh, yeah, how Hydra works. Uh, so, there's, uh, so there are like functions that have yeah, names. How sophisticated is each module and how much time did it take for you to make them? Uh, um, each, each kind of function name actually just corresponds to a small piece of shader code and the shader code is what runs directly on the graphics card. And then based on the order that you um, type things, it configures the shader code in different ways. Mm -hmm. um, and actually, I wrote most of Hydra, it took about a month and a half or so to write the whole thing. But it, this always happens with projects where like the first 90% goes really fast and then the last 10% takes forever. And so there's still things that I, it still feels unfinished to me three years later, but <laughs> it happened. Yeah, here's, uh, I think this should be, Maybe our last question. Uh, what do you wish uh, you could do in a browser that is not possible at the moment? Oh. I'm drawing a blank right now, but I know there's lots of things, <laughs> but I can't, I can't think of, um, I'm drawing a blank. I'll have to come back to it, to that question. Okay, okay, yeah, this is like a tough one, probably. Um, but yeah, so Olivia, it's been a pleasure. And it was really nice uh, talking to you about Hydra. And I'm already uh, very excited uh, and looking forward to, to a two day workshop uh, starting tomorrow. So uh, Thursday and Friday from 4 to 7pm. Uh, we're having a workshop and uh, yes so thank you very much I don't know maybe any last uh, words you would like to to say to our uh, viewers um no last words <laughs> thank you for having no me last words. <laughs> <laughs> I'm looking forward to um tomorrow and and uh Friday and also if you have any um questions that came up from this talk. I have some things planned for the workshop, but also if there's specific aspects that you're especially interested in, um, I will, at the beginning, we will talk about that. So feel free to bring ideas of things that are interesting to you as well. Yeah, sounds cool. Uh, maybe any, any uh, things that we should check out before tomorrow, like uh, anything? Um, not that I can think of it. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Thank you very much. And it was a real ple pleasure having you here. And uh, thank you everyone for watching. Yes. Have a nice evening, everyone. <laughs>